Hello there. We are now at the penultimate episode of Obi-Wan Kenobi and throughout this video we're going to be breaking down all the easter eggs, hidden details and things you missed. I also want to discuss the series as a whole and my general reaction to it, but we'll go over that towards the end of the video. Heavy spoilers from here on out, so if you haven't had a chance to check out the episode, then check out now. If you enjoy the video, pretend I'm the like button and hit me baby Obi one more time. F sake. The puns start getting really bad 5 episodes in and with out of the way, I love you. Now let's get into Obi-Wan Kenobi. Okay, so last week had Obi-Wan launching an attack on Fortress Inquisitorius in order to rescue Princess Leia. Vader was p***ed at Reva for letting him get away, however she had a new hope in the fact she'd placed a tracking device aboard the Millennium Lola, so Lola, her name was Lola, she was a probe droid and now she's given them a way to track down the group. Now we start off on Coruscant with a flashback to the time of the Clone Wars without the Bacta tank. In the same place that we saw the younglings training in episode 1, we watch Anakin and Obi-Wan dueling it out. This is back when they were both mates around the time of Attack of the Clones, which we can tell due to the hairstyles that the pair have. Anakin is still an apprentice, hence the ponytail, and it's one of Vader's fondest memories. We actually open by looking at Padme's penthouse and pull out to see Anakin staring at it. I'm guessing this takes place just after they got married and he's clearly thinking about the character. Throughout this episode we get several flashbacks of it and it shows Anakin's impatience, anger and also the differences between the two. The battle of course holds more meaning now that they're enemies and it's filled with lots of foreshadowing to the fights they'd have later on. The combat style is also more in line with the prequels and we've seen throughout the show how Vader adopted a different style of fighting in episode 3 that was more in line with what he had later on. We get two versions of him in flashbacks throughout the episode and this is when he's still a Jedi and later on when he becomes a Sith. He almost beats Obi-Wan but this episode shows there are other ways to fight and Anakin actually learns this as we get further into it. He knocks Obi-Wan's weapon out of his hand and we also get this line. Your weapon's gone. It's over. Your need for victory Anakin, it blinds you. Later Obi-Wan hands over his weapon and he theorizes that Vader will be unable to see the plan with Reva because he's blinded by his need to win. Anakin very much strikes with rage and frustration and this is a similar thing to what he did in their battle in episode 3. This wailing away is also something that Luke did in Return of the Jedi when he completely lost control and it's very much a pathway to the dark side. We cut to the bridge of his Star Destroyer to see him gazing out into the galaxy. This is a motif that's popped up several times in the saga and it's not only where we last saw him in Revenge of the Sith but it's also a stance he took after beating Luke in Empire. This Star Destroyer is Devastator class and it's one of the most iconic ships in the Star Wars universe. This has appeared a number of times throughout the saga and the first time it showed up in the timeline was during the Battle of Scarif in Rogue One when Vader arrived. It later appeared at the start of A New Hope and then at the beginning of the Battle of Hoth, all of which were considered victories for the Empire. Enter Reva who informs him that Obi-Wan is just arriving on Jabim. This was the planet that we saw last time and it has a number of things that have happened there in the expanded lore. After Order 66, this planet became the final sanctuary for the path and it's where the force sensitive people who made it there receive new identities. It was also a planet that fell under the control of the First Order and using Wookiee slaves they mined the thing dry. Reva is told to kneel and she's given the position of Grand Inquisitor, making her Vader's right hand a bit of a joke cause, cause it got cut off. <laughs> Looks like things are all falling into place as she gets to be assistant to the regional Sith Lord and we later learn this is all part of a plan in which she's actually hunting Vader for what he did on the Jedi Temple. Now Obi-Wan arrives to find that Haja is now there and we discover after the end of episode 2 that he became wanted by the Empire. Broken talks about how the people there have all been waiting for a transport to leave and typically those here would be sent on secret trade routes throughout the galaxy. These were unmonitored by the Empire and they allowed characters like Han Solo to carry out smuggling jobs. Lola goes into one of the service tunnels and we saw something similar in the Mandalorian when Grogu attempted to fix the Razor Crest at the start of the Ahsoka episode. The droid ends up sealing them inside in order to get them to surrender which is what the main focus of the episode centers around. On the wall Obi-Wan sees the names of Jedi along with the crest in the middle. This is of course similar to the Underground Railroad one in episode 3 and alongside it are some lightsabers. Now as we know these are all personally built by the Jedi and I actually went through a guide of lightsaber handles that have appeared in the saga and tried to match them up. However, I couldn't find many that really lined up except for this one which belongs to Glup Shitto. Just kidding, 
The second one from the left actually looks a lot like Quinlan Vosses, who we know also travelled on the path. He was a rebellious badass Jedi that was name dropped in episode 3, and it does seem like it belongs to him. Let me know below though if you know the others as well, and you know, just putting comments on the video, it helps actually push this one, so I'm gonna trick you into doing one. Now there's also a robe alongside it, and this brings back memories of the Order to Obi-Wan. Vader sends in two landing ships, and these look like the precursors to the one from the start of The Force Awakens. There's several aliens in the hangar, including Trandoshans, who put their heads together. These are the same species as Bosk, and it really shows the despair they have. Outside the Stormtroopers arrive with Reva, and along with the repeating blaster, we can also catch Purge Troopers. These were actually the personal forces of the Inquisitors, and they were adept soldiers promoted for their ability to track and kill Jedi. They managed to keep it pretty tense, even though it's mostly just them standing outside the door, constantly shooting for ages, like, like 20 minutes. Now unable to get to the hangar, they end up sending Leia into the vents to do a die hard on her white gown, and Obi-Wan pulls his hollow projector out of his pocket. This was the tool the Jedi often carried with them alongside their comlink, and he opens it to a message from Bail Organa. He says he's gonna go to Tatooine to protect the boy, and we get lots of beard stroking, lots of beard stroking from Obi-Wan. This is something that Ewan McGregor adopted throughout the saga, and it's also a gesture he did at the end of Revenge of the Sith. Look, yeah, I'll admit the Easter eggs, they're pretty sh** this episode, mate. Got like, three good ones, yeah? So, if you wanna go watch the Ms. Marvel video that we did instead, I don't bloody blame you. Anyway, Tala goes to meet him, and you might recognise this room as being where he recovered in the back to tank last week. She brings up the planet Garel, a rocky, desert-like one located in the Outer Rim. As she says, this was controlled by the Empire, but a rebel group known as the Phoenix Cell managed to rise up there. Though she doesn't bring it up per se, it is likely that Tala was instrumental in the fractures of the group starting up because of what they witnessed. The Inquisitors ruthlessly wiped out several families in front of her and her squadron, which caused dissent. We see that she's knocked up tally marks on her blaster holster, which as we learned is located on the opposite side of how it's normally wore so that she's a quicker draw. I counted 14, and this mirrors the fact that she says 14 people died there because of the Inquisitors. Roken calls them out, and we see an astromech droid at this point. Now this could be R2-D2, however, we know from the first episode that he was alongside C-3P on Alderaan, so I don't know if he would end up here. Obi-Wan wants to communicate with Reva, and he brings up the point that she knew Vader was Anakin, which, as we theorised, means that she met him during Order 66. See kids, I told you it was worth sitting through all those theory time, theory time, theory time. Now Anakin arrived hood up like how he did in Revenge of the Sith, and he mercilessly cut down the other younglings in front of her. At the start of episode 1 there were 5 younglings, so there being just 3 here shows the other 2 were wiped out in the skirmish. In the background we can also catch a downed Jedi beside a trooper from the 501st, possibly hinting at them dying in order to protect the kids. The 501st was also the unit that we saw the markings of on the homeless trooper in episode 2, showing the complete disregard the Imperials had for the clones after Order 66. Though we only get a split second shot of one of the younglings getting cut down, I believe that this is the same one we saw in the tomb last week. Huge shout out to Jeff Harm on Twitter for pointing out this on our last breakdown, and due to them still being in their training gear, they likely would have been snatched right away after the attack played out. Huge shout outs to Ricky Kale on Instagram for pointing out there's also this figure in robes, and they do look somewhat similar to Palpatine's assistant, Yanis Grigatis. The timeline is off for this with his appearance being in Return of the Jedi, but the robes do look very similar. So there is potential that they either come from the same order, or they might be a relative or something along those lines. It is possible that they're also one of the Witches of Dathomir, force sensitive mystics that have acted as both allies and antagonists in the Star Wars saga. If you've played Fallen Order, then you'll remember that they popped up in that, and they were also mentioned in the Book of Boba Fett as being Rancor Riders. I think that's the more likely option, and it paints out the picture that this facility is experimenting on the corpses of the force sensitive beings here. We know that Palpatine was currently in the process of attempting to clone not only himself, but also Snoke, so this kinda lines up. Now I think this will basically be the next step up from the cloning facility on Kamino, and we'll learn that this is the place they started trying to take midichlorians from others so that they could place them into clone bodies. This was something that the Imperials were seemingly attempting to do with Grogu as well, and potentially we'll learn more about this next week. Though, don't count on it though, because they've just been laying the breadcrumbs for this forever. Nariva says she thought Anakin was there to help, but all he wanted to do was kill younglings. This is likely where she gained her distrust for the Jedi, and she played dead. We discover Vader stabbed her in the stomach, and she laid with the other bodies in order to avoid detection. We also learn Reva's true motives, and as we talked about on our earlier video, 
Can't remember who said it exactly, but shout out to them again for saying that Reva was trying to gain a private audience with Vader so that she could kill him and in taking Obi-Wan to the villain, this would gain his trust. She doesn't believe Obi-Wan will actually kill him and as we saw in Revenge, he left him for dead rather than finishing the job. She blames him for not helping the younglings and this was also something we discussed on previous videos. If you cast your mind back to Revenge, you'll remember that he and Yoda went to the temple, watched the CCTV tapes and Obi-Wan ended up venturing to Mustafar rather than staying to search for survivors. If he stayed, he would have helped out others and this likely would have stopped Reva going to the Imperials. Again, theory time right, theory time right, theory time right, we, could, we got it right. Now she slices through the blast doors in a move that's similar to Qui-Gon cutting into one in the Phantom Menace. Could have done this way, way earlier and saved everyone some time and it leads to a big shootout. We see that Roken carries a bowcaster and this was also the preferred weapon of Chewbacca. Obi-Wan breaks out the blocks like I do when anyone says this video is crap and they really show stormtroopers can't shoot for sh** because they're like, they're like right in front of your mate and you're, you're missing them, you're crap. Atala is shot as is Ned and they cut the sound out and play emotional music over the top similar to the ending of Rogue One so it feels, it, it just, it just feels emotional. Now this reminded me a lot of K2SO's death but she goes the extra mile by setting off a thermal detonator. This was something Leia threatened to do in Return of the Jedi and we see the full effects of this play out whereas Jabba and that de-escalated the situation. Vader orders Reva to stand down as he believes that Obi-Wan will do anything to protect the people and that this includes surrendering. In episode 1 as we saw, Nori refused to let others get hurt and this is of course ingrained into the Jedi code. Obi-Wan refused to do this in episode 1 so he shows he's slowly going back to his old ways. He hands over his gears and we see that it's all part of his plan to try and get Reva to work with him in taking down the villain. He pleads to her using the same things that Tala witnessed, bringing up families and sort of doing a Kylo Ren and Rey in how they took down Snoke. Leia finds a restraining bolt on Lola in the vents and she ends up removing this. This was something that was also placed on R2-D2 and C-3PO by the Jawas and allows anyone to basically control the droids if needs be. Leia opens the hangar doors, the people go to escape and Vader marches in, pulling down the transport through the use of the force. This is something that we've seen at multiple points in the franchise and not only did Rey do it in Rise of Skywalker, but we also saw Starkiller do it in The Force Awakens to bring down an entire Star Destroyer. It's a bait and switch, like the show, and the real transport manages to make it out. Vader was seemingly blinded by his victory of taking down the transport that he missed the other one and it's sort of like poetry they rhyme. However, he does suss things out, so perhaps this was part of his own plan to sniff out Reva's true intentions. In the wide shot of the hangar, we can also catch the T-47 airspeeders that they used to launch the rescue mission last week. Haja also leaves the hollow projector and we get flashbacks in which Obi-Wan beats old Anakin, because hey, you can tell this isn't a 20 year old. Guys like, how do you do fellow kids? What? But the lesson here is important. Anakin was constantly trying to prove himself, but this was his undoing. Reva goes to attack, however he catches the blade using the force and easily beats her without busting out his own blade. We see the quadruple styles of the Inquisitor lightsaber and this includes the single blade, double, spinning one and then the duel. Vader ends up going toe to toe with her using the other one and much in the same way that Obi-Wan beat him by stealing his blade, Darth does the same thing. This is probably the standout scene in the series for me and we get flashes of her childhood as he walks towards her. The stabbing in her youth is also the same as what happens here and she ends up surviving it because look, you, sh you should have just killed her mate. Now basically it turns out that Obi-Wan and Reva's theory time was wrong and we also get the return of the Grand Inquisitor who likely told Vader the truth. Now he is a character that we've talked and talked and talked about every week and we did bring up several times how we thought he was still alive. This was actually somewhat spoiled last week when Rupert Friend who played the character appeared on Jimmy Kimmel. They brought up the fact that he got stabbed in the stomach and Friend added that he only got stabbed in one of them. If you've been watching our videos then you'll know how we had someone on Twitter called Kylo Zen reach out to us to talk about the novel Star Wars The Last Shot. This discussed how Power and Males had two stomachs and we theorised that this could be how he survived eating a balti from Ken's super hot Indians down the road from me. Available now. Now Vader also calls her youngling, further calling back to her past in order to belittle her. Reva finds the hollow projector and the message from Bale lets her know about Tatooine. Now she likely feels abandoned by Obi-Wan once more and sees this as her being left to be stabbed so that he can get away again. I do think that it'll go down on Tatooine next week but I think when she discovers that he's protecting a child that she will see she had the wrong impression of him 
and that she was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Judging by Obi-Wan's expression at the end, it seems like he's surprised the plan didn't work and he knew he'd be abandoning Reva to go toe to toe with Vader. Makes it seem like he didn't really care about her, and this is why the ending is so worrying as she likely wants revenge. Pretty solid episode, I must say I love the last 10 minutes and watching Vader just go all out crazy, it's always great to see. However, I do feel like they're just dragging their heels a bit with it, and though they had that great lightsaber fight, the character and story progression feels a bit lacking to me. Now don't go, don't go hating on heavy spoilers, yeah? I, I just feel like there's some head scratching character decisions and, you know, it's not awful or even bad. I just don't feel it's really elevating or setting a high standard across the show and there probably are more misses than hits for me if we're talking about things in general. Now as I said this episode had some brilliant moments in it and I feel that the show is at its strongest when it's focusing on the relationship between Anakin and Obi-Wan. These two characters being former friends that are now at opposite ends of the spectrum for me is the most interesting thing and whenever we get introspective moments about their past that lines up with the present it always just kind of elevates the show in my opinion. I feel like episodes like this should have been more common throughout the series and it's always nice seeing them kind of go toe to toe both mentally strategically and just doing whatever they can to try and beat the other. Now as I said this did have some good moments in it, love the flashbacks and the fight at the end but it did kind of meander getting to those moments and uh, I don't know if I feel a bit met on it but I'm definitely not on the high that I was at the end of episode 3. So yeah I do feel a bit mixed on it but but there's definitely scenes in this that I will revisit, I just don't feel it is crazy the best Star Wars ever like I'm seeing uh, the reaction being on Twitter. So hate all you want but I don't give a now that's my thoughts on the episode and for the next part of the video I thought I'd go over my general feelings of the series. I did a big Twitter thread about this last week and I think my main issue of the Disney shows in general is that most of them are written like 6 hour movies rather than what they are which is of course a TV show. The 6 hour movie thing is something you hear constantly popping up whenever they talk in interviews and I think it has both its pros and cons. Now the majority of TV shows in general tend to have an almost sort of self-contained episode feeling where there's a little mini adventure with characters and then you might get something at the end that teases towards the greater plot. This is seen in things like Rick and Morty, Star Trek, well, well the earlier stuff, Quantum Leap, X-Files, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., The Mandalorian, Heroes and so on and so forth. This isn't across the board obviously but on the whole this is a format that writers tend to adopt. Now these long form movie formats for shows often work but they tend to bring in a lot of characters so that things don't get stale. You see this in stuff like Stranger Things where it feels very cinematic and it isn't exactly standalone but you have so many characters in it that it doesn't get boring. I think the main issue I have with Obi-Wan is that we have the Leia rescue mission but it's being dragged out for hours and hours and hours with very few characters so it feels a bit unnecessary. Remember this is pretty much the exact same storyline as A New Hope but that had way more going on in way less time. When coming into the show I thought it would be a sort of Adventures of Obi-Wan type thing where he'd be on Tatooine, maybe he'd come across a character that was down on their luck, help them out and pop back to Luke to make sure he's okay. This is a format we saw in the comics and it allowed Obi-Wan to have run-ins with Black Crescentin, Jabba the Hutt and many of the big names that exist on the planet. Maybe I had the wrong expectations for it, but I thought we'd get an almost incredible Hulk type of show where Obi-Wan would wander into town, he'd help someone out, this would make him bust out a lightsaber, it would alert the Empire and then he'd have to flee before Vader showed up. Again this is all just my opinion but with there being rumours that we're getting a second season, I hope they go that route instead of the way they are with these 6 hour long simplistic stories. I am still enjoying the series but I just think that they should maybe do a longer one where we have 8 to 10 episodes with more self contained stories rather than what we have. I know it's super difficult for Lucasfilm as well as they have so many toxic opinions to deal with too so it's probably difficult for them to actually figure out what critiques to listen to and what ones to ignore. Anyway that's our thoughts and all the easter eggs we could find in this episode. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, if you agree with what I'm saying, if you disagree and like this, this 6 hour thing then yeah, comment below let me know, I really don't mind. You can disagree all you want, it's fine. As a thank you for that yeah, you'll be entered into a competition where we're giving away 3 copies of everything everywhere all at once on the 15th of July. Just don't tell those people that disagree with me, they've got no chance of winning. <laughs> I'm just kidding, yeah? And all you have to do to be on the chance of getting it is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on, and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the episode. We pick the comments at random a month from now, and the winners of the last one are on screen right now, so message me at heavy spoilers if that's you. 
If you want something else to watch, then make sure you check out our breakdown of Ms. Marvel, which will be linked on screen right now. We've gone over the most recent episode, so definitely go head over there right after this. Without the way, thanks for sticking through the video. I've been Paul, and I'll see you next time. Take care, peace.